All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for joining us. My name is David Chuebo. I'm Associate Dean in the UAB College of Arts and Sciences, and I'm glad to welcome you to uh, what actually is the last Haddon Forum of the 2020-2021 academic year. Um, I hope that perhaps we can look forward to some live in-person Haddon Forums in the fall, or perhaps some sort of a hybrid situation. But for now, we're happy to have uh, Dr. Magna Slavarsky with us. Uh, from the um, sociology department to talk about some of her research. Uh, Magda earned her bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Michigan, and then her PhD from the University of Cincinnati. And I think um, when I was kind of contemplating what, what to say in this brief introduction, what really struck me about, about her scholarship is how nicely it, it really fits in the UAB culture. And, and, and I think of that in two different ways. I, I think the first is uh, the real interdisciplinary nature of her research. And I think you will hear that today. You will, I'm sure, hear basic sociological theory and, and a real focus on sociological science. Um, but at the same time, I think you'll see the, the application of that science to public health and, and to medicine. And um, I think that reflects how nicely we at UAB uh, merge basic uh, science, whether it be basic natural science or basic social science into applied questions for human health. Uh, the second uh, aspect of her research that I think really reflects the UAB culture beautifully is, is an international uh, focus and, and, and being a global thinker. Uh, and we see that in her title and, and I think it will come out very clearly um, really our, our obligation in my mind as scientists to study the health of all people, um, to think about the health challenges and equities here in our local community, but as well as those who are vulnerable, disadvantaged, or, or stigmatized across the world. And uh, so she's done quite a bit of research in Eastern Europe and, and in Germany, and, and I know we'll hear pieces of that in today's talk as well. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Magda Slavarsky. And you see uh, on her title page here, a talk called COVID-19 Experiences and Reactions in the United States and Poland. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for your kind uh, introduction, uh, Dr. Schwebel. Um, I believe there's some international and maybe lay audience out there so um, um, I will try to provide some explanation where needed during the talk and reduce technical language. Um, to start, I would like to note that this talk is really well timed with where we are with this pandemic. Uh, yesterday was the anniversary of the uh, WHO, World Health Organizations, declaring the COVID-19 outbreak a pandemic. And we just passed the 100 million mark of infectious, of infectious worldwide. Uh, in his speech to Americans last night, President Biden provided a picture of both COVID-19 tremendous impact on our lives and expressed hope to conquer the virus with vaccinations and other public health measures. My slides won't go. One moment, please. Uh, let's see. I think we have IT support on the line if we need it. There we go. Thank yes, you. That's good. Thanks. Um, so people like me whose lives are rooted in more than one country and culture have followed the trajectory of the pandemic in different parts of the world very closely connecting with families and friends in other countries and sharing experiences and observations. To me, it became apparent quickly in the spring of last year that it would be useful to document the similarities and differences in those experiences between our lives in the United States and in my homeland, Poland. Little is still known about people's experiences and reactions to COVID-19 in different countries. Uh, I think it's interesting to examine the United States and Poland because these countries have had different modern histories and standing in the world, but they have been converging over the last decade or so on several important social trends. 
So the US has been a global power, historically considered a stable country and a democratic and economic stronghold. However, it's currently tested with the rise of populism and attacks on democracy. Poland has had a turbulent modern history. It has been a central site of two world war wars and um, of the Soviet style communism between 1945 and 89. Since 1989, Poland has built a democratic state and a market economy, joined the NATO and the EU, but in the recent decades has been backsliding in terms of democracy with the rise of populism and nationalism. Considering this overlap in social trends between these two countries, I embarked on an empirical study to compare COVID-19 experiences and reactions in, uh, in the two countries. So the plan for this talk today is to first briefly outline the social cultural conditions that make the US and Poland in some ways different and in some ways alike. Then compare COVID-19 trajectories in the first six months of the pandemic between the two countries. And finally, in more detail, tell you about the study that I conducted in the summer of last year. America is divided and the whole world knows it. The divisions have played into the pandemic responses with political conservatives largely resisting and liberals largely complying with COVID-19 restrictions on personal freedoms. In Poland, currently divisions also cut deep. Democracy there is also tested as it is elsewhere in Central Europe as well. In 2018, The Atlantic published the warning from Europe, the worst is yet to come. Polarization, conspiracy theories, attacks on the free press, an obsession with loyalty, recent events in the United States follow a pattern Europeans know all too well. Others have traced the rise and then regression of democracy in Poland in the recent years. The trajectory here on this chart is marked with the purple line showing by 2018 drop uh, in democratic principles in Poland. And currently Poland is only second to Hungary with this democratic backsliding. In fact, Poland is no longer rated by some researchers as full democracy. As you see here on this chart, the red line for Poland between 2010 dropping from a category of consolidated democracy to the category of semi-consolidated democracy. The American National Public Radio, NPR, has reported a number of stories on Poland and the heading speaks for themselves. Poland's overhaul of its courts leads to confrontation with European Union. Poland's government tightens its control over media. In Poland, protest as near total ban on abortions goes into effect. Poland breaches EU obligations over LGBT and women's rights. And perhaps the most notable is as an election nears in Poland, and that was in 2019 and 20, church and state are a popular combination. And in the pictures you see uh, the government leaders with um, representatives of the Polish Catholic Church. So these headings actually sound too familiar for us in America. However, the religion's influence in state affairs is much more explicit in Poland, I think. So with this review of social trends, let's turn to the pandemic and the two countries' responses. And so I went through this exercise and I don't expect you to read the details on this slide, but I wanted to trace and see the response of, in Poland and in the United States from early uh, of 2020. So 
you see January, February, and March here on this slide. And what you see on the left column under the US is this black uh, blank gap with nothing going on. Even though the United, in the United States, we had the White House uh, coronavirus test form in late February, there is not much going on in early March. On the right, in the right column under what was going on in Poland, you can notice that early March, in early March, the EU raised the threat level from COVID-19 from medium to high. And then quickly measures were introduced. There was in Poland, there was a mandatory quarantine and epidemiological supervision of people who are suspected of COVID. Um, introduced quickly. There was border sanitary control with ID card check and temperature checks. And by, the, by March 10th, there was a national ban then on mass gatherings. And by, the, by March 11th, there was a national mandate to close schools, universities, other educational institutions, uh, as well as cultural entertainment venues. And so it shows you that response in Poland was much quicker than in the US. And then when you move further into March, uh, both countries in, by mid-March have announced national state of emergency. But then while the US has focused on travel bans from other parts of the world into the US, um, in Poland, further measures against COVID-19 were introduced especially ban on gatherings and businesses closings, uh, basically only essential uh, businesses being open. In addition, so the Pol Poland has a national healthcare system. And so immediately mandated which sector within healthcare will take care of the COVID patients. And so 19 hospitals in Poland were designated as COVID-19 hospitals with full access to medical services for COVID-19 cases. And there was at least one such uh, hospital in each of Poland's 16 provinces. So obviously, you know, that's not comparable to what uh, we had, have had here in the US. It was interesting that by mid-March, the Polish Catholic Church introduced dispense for worshipers unable to attend services because of the threat of COVID and also and called for virtual worship services. And I don't know if you recall in the United States, there was a lot of discussion about also churches closings and uh, places of worships closings. And sometimes these cases went to court as some of the conservative uh, communities and religious communities were fighting the restrictions on public gatherings. So, um, and this is the last part of the trajectory of the pandemic in both countries I want to show you here in the detail is that by, my point is by late March, Poland was pretty much shut down. And in the US, while the New York City cases surged, uh, states began slowly closing, issuing stay at home orders. But again, by that time, Poland has been almost completely shut down. So there you have see that you know, the lack of the federal response in the US, slow state response in the US, and then in contrast in Poland, you see a strong national response. So now when you look at the trajectory of the pandemic in terms of cases, so th these numbers are standardized, right? It's a uh, number of cases, daily cases per uh, million people. And so there's a trajectory here between December and July. And at the end of the talk, I will actually show you what it looks like today. Um, but obviously, there's a huge gap, right? Pol Poland's cases are really low, marked with a green line, and then surging US cases marked with a red line. In terms of deaths, a similar um, picture, uh, cumulative deaths, much, much higher in the United States by July um, than in Poland. So my research questions, and I was as I was thinking and comparing the trends, um, both at this on this uh, in terms of the social cultural conditions and um, also the pandemic trajectory. Um, I wanted to know what, how the people's experiences in the two countries will be different or similar uh, during the pandemic. Uh, in order to investigate that, 
question, I really needed to focus on what factors would shape people's experiences of the pandemic and reactions to it in general. So I looked into uh, some relevant social theory and literature that would guide me in my investigation. There was some emerging literature, in fact, on COVID um, and um, influences of these three groups of factors in terms of shaping uh, COVID-19 experiences and reactions. One group is political ideology, ideological factors. Second, religion playing a big role. And the third, social inequalities, and especially social inequalities in health. So in terms of uh, ideology, um, emerging research has already had already shown that conservatives, conservatives in the United States and Poland and also in other countries uh, appear to be less concerned with COVID-19 from the beginning of the pandemic. Um, uh, several important polls were done uh, in different countries to uh, support this idea. Um, conservators also felt more frustrated with and uh, fought restrictions uh, in comparison with liberals who are more receptive of the public um, health measures. Um, conservatives also trusted information about pandemic coming out from the conservative governments more than other authoritative sources, such as those of uh, um, scientists and uh, medical professionals. In fact, uh, I found a Polish study that examined how COVID-19 threat promoted social conservatism and right-wing presidential candidates in last year's elections, both in the US and Poland. So that was a very interesting comparison. Uh, now, in terms of religious beliefs and how they may impact the, um, especially the perceptions of COVID-19, um, but also behaviors, um, religion is well known in various um, bodies of knowledge as a frame of reference for people as they live uh, through their experiences in the world. And the religion intersects with political ideology that uh, with stronger uh, religious beliefs, you uh, very often see stronger conservatism and um, social conservatism. And then there's intersection with science too. Religion and science have always interacted in all kinds of ways. Sometimes, a lot of times, uh, being kind of contradictory in, um, in their past. And finally, it's clear that social inequality is widely spread in all societies, no matter how um, equal they try to get. Um, we have groups within our society who are always vulnerable, such as uh, low income people and racial ethnic minorities and the elderly and children in terms of age groups. Um, and then also there, 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 there's differentials, differential outcomes in health, especially in terms of where people live. So residence location, for example, urban location versus rural location makes a difference. And also geographically where people live makes a difference for health especially. So there are inequalities socially in general and then especially in health. So these three kind of bodies of knowledge and literatures that I was guided by um, led me to kind of think more uh, in terms of uh, building this conceptual framework for my study to examine COVID-19 attitudes, behaviors, experiences, and impacts. And so you see uh, uh, the things I'm interested in in the dark green box on the right, and then the factors that would shape these uh, attitudes, behaviors, experiences, and impacts. Um, underlying is the country context. So um, I hypothesized that the social cultural conditions in Poland and the United States would um, shape COVID-19 attitudes, behaviors, experiences, and impacts. But in addition, as I just reviewed um, the ideological factors, especially in terms of political ideology, religious beliefs, but also trust in science would shape those experiences. Um, in addition, socioeconomic status of individuals would play into how they perceive the pandemic and uh, behave in terms of uh, public health me measures and guidelines. And finally, from the emerging literature, we know that there are already socio-demographic um, variations in impacts of COVID-19 
in terms of uh, the elderly being more impacted than younger age groups, uh, women being uh, vulnerable in uh, specific ways compared with men, um, the issue of being married or not, or having children in the household, and finally place of residence. These are some factors that will shape COVID-19 experiences in the two countries. So my general hypothesis for the study was that COVID-19 attitudes experiences among adults will vary by country, political ideology, religiosity, trust in science, and sociodemographic factors, including socioeconomic status. But more specifically, I also hypothesized that experiences and impacts would be less negative in Poland than in the US, uh, over and beyond other factors, because what I just showed you in terms of the trajectory of the pandemic being different uh, and having less impact in terms of uh, looking at epidemiology um, in Poland than in the US. Um, I also specifically hypothesized that political conservatism, religiosity, and low trust in science about COVID-19 would be associated with uh, more positive views of conservative governments, COVID-19 responses, uh, more trust in such governments messaging and less trust in science-based approaches to COVID, um, and a stronger opposition to restrictions on personal freedoms. And finally, I hypothesized that vulnerable groups such as the elderly, women, and low-income individuals would report higher COVID-19 threats and impact. And, um, I wasn't able to test all these hypotheses in my study for um, data limitation reasons, but most of them uh, I have or I am in the process of testing. So I will show you what I have so far. So in the summer of 2020, I conducted a cross-sectional online survey of residents uh, in the United States and Poland, uh, 18 years and older. Uh, I used a structured questionnaire uh, in English and in Polish uh, that included um, measures of COVID-19 threat, impacts, experiences um, that were drawn from uh, public health toolboxes available through the NIH, National Institutes of Health here in the US, uh, the CDC, Cent uh, uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and, and, and so on, um, especially, and I'll show you in a moment, I used um, a, a battery of uh, measures um, from the University of Montana, a political social psychology lab um, led by uh, Luke Conway. Um, I also threw in the survey collected you know, sociodemographic information and knowing that these online surveys uh, have to be short, it's not like you conduct a big sociological study where you sit down with people for an hour or two and gather all the information from them. So um, I, the average uh, completion time for my survey was less than 20 minutes. I had to be um, uh, where the people will wear off quickly while responding to my questions. Um, the data were collected uh, between June and July of 2020. I used um, uh, professional personal email lists to distribute the survey link. And I also posted it on social media and um, obviously requested everyone to send it to anybody they know in Poland and in the United States. Part of the survey uh, targeted healthcare workers. So we, I also made sure that I had some email lists uh, and social media uh, specific um, targets um, that would let me collect data from healthcare workers from uh, in both countries. So in terms of the COVID-19 measures, I mentioned Conway, I used uh, some of his work that is actually posted in one of the NIH toolboxes uh, available online. Um, and this battery of measures um, uh, looks at uh, COVID-19 perceived threat, um, federal national government response assessment of that in the view of the respondents. Uh, respondents' experiences during the uh, pandemic and impacts of the pandemic on their lives. Um, and in, the, in addition, in this uh, presentation, I will also show you a brief analysis of looking at um, uh, COVID-19 practices, including uh, masking, uh, using protective gloves and social distancing, uh, following complying with social distancing rules in the two countries. 
So uh, here is a, uh, just to give you an example of what these battery of items, batteries of items uh, examining the experiences, impacts, perceived threat, th threats of COVID-19 look like. So for the perceived threat of coronavirus, we ask questions such as, thinking about the coronavirus makes me feel threatened. And respondents were asked to uh, uh, mark to what degree they disagree or agree with the statement on a seven point scale. Another item asked uh, or stated, uh, I am afraid of the coronavirus. And again, respondents will disagree or agree on a seven point scale with this statement. In terms of the federal national or national government response uh, reactions to it, uh, some items asked about um, supporting government measures to restrict the movement of citizens to curb the spread of coronavirus. Um, and uh, another item here, number three, uh, uh, states, I want my government to severely punish those who violate orders to stay at home. And I will, uh, that will, will be an interesting comparison uh, I'll show in a couple of minutes between the two countries. Um, in terms of coronavirus impacts, um, the, some of the statements uh, asked about um, work-related situation, whether people have lost jobs or incomes due to coronavirus, or also looking at psychological impacts, whether the people have uh, felt depressed because of the coronavirus situation. Uh, in terms of other experiences, um, uh, the experiences actually deal more with the direct contact with people who have been infected or have died, um, and um, so those kind of things. We also uh, uh, there was also an item about following news about COVID nineteen. That's a big thing. A lot of people, especially early in the pandemic, were glued to their phones and TV, and keeping up with the news. So how much people have been doing it in the two countries was of interest to. Um, and then in the. Uh, so in my analysis, I also use these, uh, I mentioned factors that would influence the experiences in the two countries and perceptions in the two countries. And um, so uh, the country variable uh, was included in this analysis where we looked at how these experiences, perceptions will vary by be, being a resident of Poland or the US. Um, uh, ideological factors were measured. Uh, Political ideology was measured with the, the question, do you think of yourself as liberal or conservative? And um, respondents were again asked to, uh, to mark their uh, uh, ori political orientation on a seven point scale uh, from very uh, conservative to very liberal. Um, and for this item as well as uh, religiosity and trust in science, I had to, um, uh, these items, the data uh, from these items were not uh, normally distributed as we say uh, in statistical terms. So I used categories uh, uh, that would fit into the li liberal, moderate or conservative orientation or in terms of religiosity having low, moderate or high religiosity. And then in trust in science was dichotomized uh, looking at low versus high trust in science in terms of information about COVID-19 specifically. I assessed socioeconomic status of respondents in the survey. Um, education uh, also had to be dichotomized. Uh, as, so the, uh, the indicator was whether respondent was college educated or had less education. Uh, financial status, so typically in sociology, we assess uh, uh, individual or family incomes. Uh, it was an online uh, uh, survey. Uh, I didn't uh, think, I didn't feel people would be comfortable reporting income. Um, and, you know, I didn't want people to drop out because they didn't want to answer this question. And by the way, I um, uh, constructed the survey in a way that people had to answer each question to move on in the survey and to complete it because I didn't want any missing data. So if people would exit the survey because of income, I didn't feel that that would be justified. So instead I asked, how do you assess your financial status relative to other people in your country? And uh, so that uh, relative uh, financial status measures have been used in sociology as well. And they uh, seem to be robust and helpful. Um, and I measured a whole list of um, 
uh, sociodemographic characteristics of the respondents. So in the analysis I will present to you and the findings from it, um, I had a sample of uh, 538 individuals and I'll show you the distribution by country in a moment. I ran some statistical analyses to um, both show comparisons and the different uh, factors and uh, outcomes uh, between Poland and the United States and also uh, do multivariable analyses um, of what factors uh, uh, are important uh, for shaping, we, as we hypothesize, uh, COVID-19 perceived threat and support for COVID-19 restrictions. I'm limiting uh, uh, my discussion just with these two outcomes uh, because we have limited time today. And so in terms of the findings um, the, from the main analysis, um, in, First, I would like to present the sample character, uh, characteristics, the sociodemographic characteristics of the sample. So 54% uh, of respondents were based in the US and 46% in Poland. Uh, in terms of age groups, you will notice marked in red, there were differences uh, between the two countries that we had more people in Poland uh, from younger age groups between 18 and 29 years and then the situation was reversed for the uh, 50 to 64 years that we had more of folks falling into this category in the US than in Poland. And then I marked, uh, highlighted in yellow, the fact that this sample was, well, sample was uh, in the majority female uh, women and um, college educated. And I'm marking it because I keep that in mind as I go forward, as I interpret my findings, that uh, the findings may not be necessarily generalizable to the whole population, right? But the sample is highly educated and largely female. Uh, there were differences in other sociodemographic characteristics, such as uh, uh, we had more people who were married and having children in the US. And then the distribution in terms of uh, residence locations, urban, suburban, rural, also different, but it has to do with how Poland uh, um, uh, is divided in terms of the, uh, the, the suburbs are not really well developed. A lot of people live in urban areas in Poland and um, many also live in the rural areas more so than in the US. So here's the distribution of the ideological factors between the two countries. And so on religiosity and trust in science, there wasn't much difference. So uh, especially trust in science was high, uh, 84% in both uh, uh, countries. Uh, religiosity uh, distribution was similar, but on political ideology, please note, and I marked that in, uh, in red, that we had more people who uh, saw themselves as moderate in Poland and fewer as conservatives in turn and you know keeping in mind that it's a it's a highly educated sample we uh, we have twice as many conservatives in the us and in poland in this particular sample proportionally um here's the comparison of uh, scores distribution on the perceived threat um, uh, restrictions and experiences uh, during the pandemic and the two main differences here between Poland and the US also marked in red are that uh, the perceived threat was higher in the US in this sample than in Poland. And um, in terms of support for restrictions, uh, for example, punishing violations was, uh, there was more support for punishing violations of uh, breaking the rules in Poland than in the US. Uh, here is a further comparison of some of these uh, factors shaping experiences and uh, impacts. Um, these are uh, categorical variables, so we have percent uh, distributions. Um, in terms of reaction to limiting freedoms uh, and uh, number of people who are not upset, somewhat upset or upset, uh, was different. We had fewer people who are not uh, not upset in Poland, and that you know makes you think about you know the pandemic didn't have a such impact during the first six months in Poland and in the US, so that makes sense. Um, and we had many, uh, but then we did have a significant amount, uh, number of Poles who would uh, be upset also and many more than in the US. So that's kind of uh, what's going on with that. Then further down in terms of 
um, availability of resources, like even like things like toilet paper, we you know heard about it many times during the pandemic. We don't always have access to the resources we need in daily life. Um, so the um, the impact of access to resources was much higher in the United States than in Poland. As you twenty one percent of respondents reported high impact in terms of access to resources, and only 7% of Poles did. In terms of psychological impact, so that depression, uh, for example, how people felt, uh, you know, they felt depressed during the pandemic, that impact was also much higher in the US than in Poland, or almost twice as big. Uh, we had more people in the US reporting uh, being psychologically impacted. And then experiences with COVID-19, so knowing people who are infected or presumed infected uh, was also higher in the US than in Poland. So here, here's a, a, just a quick overview of my um, multivariable analysis when looking at different factors, taking different uh, factors into account when looking at the COVID-19 perceived threat. So country uh, was one factor that was, uh, as we say, in statistical terms, significant throughout the full analysis by adding different factors into the equation. So um, basically, um, the um, the perceived threat was lower in Poland than in the US, um, even after adding all these other factors into the equation. It's, it's this effect remains significant. Um, also, the effects of uh, ideology, moderate and conservative here. Basically, um, uh, the perceived threat was less among moderates and political conservatives than among liberals. Um, and only after adding the trust in science factor, the effect of moderate ideology was mitigated, it was basically, it was no longer sig significant, which means that among moderates, you know, whether or not they would see the perceived threat of COVID-19 as high would depend on uh, the, you know, the type of uh, the trust in science that they have, whether it was high or low. Uh, it was interesting for uh, the demographic factors that um, only uh, gender stood out as important. So women felt a higher perceived threat than men in this analysis. And here's a similar analysis looking at support for COVID-19 restrictions in the two countries. Um, actually, there was not much of a significant uh, difference by country after adding the ideological factors and sociodemographic factors and trust in science. Uh, also, women stood out as um, uh, have actually supporting the restrictions more. And then again, conservatives especially, but also moderates would support restrictions less than liberals. Uh, I also looked at COVID uh, safety practices. And so um, mask wearing uh, was less prevalent uh, in Poland and the, in the US, as you see that more Poles would never wear a mask uh, in comparison with uh, Americans. Uh, but gloves wearing was much was uh, much more prevalent uh, in Poland. So um, uh, seventy percent of Americans would say they never would wear protective gloves, but um, only twenty percent would. And so there are high numbers for people who would wear protective gloves in Poland. And then in terms of social distancing, you would have you see that more Poles um, would never social distance and. Maybe it has to do a little with the overcrowding in some places in Poland and so on. Um, and uh, fewer uh, Americans in my sample would say that it would never social distance, only 3%. So then I did a similar analysis when I looked at different factors at once that would pre predict safety practices. And uh, country was significant. Again, uh, fewer uh, Poles would comply with safety practices than the Americans. Uh, women would comply more. Uh, uh, high income people would comply more versus lower income, except after entering ideology into the equation, that effect would go away. So again, moderate and conservative ide ideologies would play in with the people from those backgrounds. 
complying less with uh, COVID-19 safety practices. And trust in science have obviously uh, playing a large role here as well. Um, and so the main findings from the, this analysis were that experiences, and uh, if you remember, I presented some hypotheses about um, experiences and impacts being less negative in Poland than in the US, and that was reflected in the findings and reflective also of the COVID-19 uh, uh, trajectory in the two countries. I, I hypothesize about the role of political conservatism, religiosity, and trust in science. And that hypothesis was also confirmed uh, and is largely, the finding is consistent with past and emerging literature on the, uh, in this area. And in terms of the vulnerable groups, I was only able to confirm that women um, uh, uh, were uh, more likely to support restrictions and had uh, feelings of higher threat from the uh, from COVID-19 than men, but I did not see any differences by age or other sociodemographic factors. And so that is not fully in line with other emerging literature that really shows that the elderly are mostly impacted and low income individuals um, and um, so other vulnerable groups as well. And in addition, like I mentioned before, I uh, gathered some data on healthcare workers. And so uh, in this sample, uh, I had 30% um, of the sample in Poland were healthcare workers and 22% in the US. Um, uh, I had uh, more medical doctors and nurses, nurses in the Polish subsample uh, than in the US subsample. Uh, in the US, I had more other medical workers. Um, from other categories. Uh, but um, now look at the contact uh, with COVID-19 among these healthcare workers. Um, so the main difference here is that uh, many more Pol Polish healthcare workers reported contact with presumed cases of COVID-19. Uh, uh, so they suspected that people had COVID, but it wasn't confirmed, perhaps because of the uh, testing availability not being there or not people are not really paying attention to it yet in the early stages of the pandemic. In terms of usage PP, uh, protective, uh, personal protective equipment was, the, that the differences were, are striking. So uh, for always using PPE P in, um, uh, uh, in, in healthcare setting, uh, the polls were most of them, 85% of healthcare workers reported always using protective equipment, uh, while only 77% uh, in the US did. And you know, if you combine it with some, some times, again, it shows that polls uh, almost always use, uh, use protective equipment versus the US. In the US, you had 12% who are not using protective equipment in healthcare setting. And now, so we followed up with a question, if uh, the pr protective equipment was used or not used, then why? And people would report uh, whether they have had enough of the protective equipment at work, uh, or they had to reuse, uh, or they simply did not need it for their work. So here looking at uh, having all the equipment needed, uh, many more Polish healthcare workers reported that they had enough uh, but twice, almost twice as many American healthcare workers reported that they had to reuse protective equipment because of shortages. Um, healthcare workers were also asked uh, uh, to uh, agree or disagree with statements about their healthcare responses uh, to the pandemic. And uh, the main difference were uh, in the statements about how overwhelmed the system was and also their healthcare setting. So many more. Uh, Polish healthcare workers did not feel that their healthcare system was that overwhelmed. Um, and then in the US, you had a lot of healthcare workers that felt that both their healthcare system was overwhelmed, their healthcare setting was overwhelmed, that they did not have enough personal protective equipment. And um, um, so those kind of things. So that the burden of, uh, of the, the of the COVID-19 impact was higher uh, here for the, the US healthcare workers in the six, uh, six months of the pandemic. And then we also asked about what they thought about having current, uh, currently effective treatments for COVID-19 and uh, prospects for uh, treatments and vaccines. 
And so the, there were small differences. Uh, so uh, in terms of effective treatments becoming available in 12 to 18 months, there were more healthcare workers on the US side than Polish side that would think that that was feasible. And, um, and the same thing with the vaccine, more uh, healthcare workers in the US thought that vaccines are on the way uh, versus healthcare workers in Poland. And uh, just two more quick findings in terms of uh, uh, kind of intersections of gender work and psychological distress. And that's an analysis I just started to work on. So it's, it's very prelim preliminary, but I looked at the financial impact and also psychological distress among women and men in Poland and in the US. And um, uh, the distributions are different uh, and uh, similar to the overall analysis that financial impacts are being uh, high, higher in the US and Poland, the same thing for psychological distress, but in, among, uh, in terms of the distribution between uh, based on gender, it's, it's different. Uh, in the US, fewer uh, men reported uh, uh, low impact. So they, women basically reported higher impact than women, which actually it's something different from what we know about what's going on with women in the US. So that tells you a little bit, you know, that female, uh, majority females in the sample and also highly educated, looks a bit different than the general population. In Poland, there were more, more uh, women who reported having high financial impacts. And in terms of psychological distress, uh, there were lower levels reported in Poland generally uh, but also with, um, uh, with women actually in both countries reporting higher psychological distress than men. And that is consistent with other literature on psychological distress generally. And, and finally, I, I did try to look uh, whether a gender um, uh, plays a role in psychological distress when looking, we're considering other factors such as you know, being in a different country and being married and having children. Um, and then also considering the moderate financial impact um, in, or high financial impact of the pandemic. And gender was not a significant factor. Basically, the, the difference between Poland and the US was uh, important and also having a uh, high financial or moderate financial impact would make a difference and having people experiencing more psychological distress uh, over and beyond the other factors. So uh, to kind of starting winding down, I would like to point out the study limitations and then obviously the gaps that are still there could be caused by future research. So the basic limitation, the most important limitation of my study is it's based on a convenience sample. I did not have a national representative sample. So there is an opportunity in the future, obviously, to gather more national representative data have better representation of lower income groups, also racial and ethnic minorities that were not well represented in the US subsample at all. Um, so, and also the, the study was cross-sectional, uh, longitudinal studies, the, you know, tracking people over time would give us more information about how people fare during the pandemic over time. Um, uh, the, uh, the sample also was limited in terms of the number of healthcare workers in the sample. So, but there is an opportunity. There was some opportunity to examine the healthcare uh, care workers' views uh, in Poland and the U.S. And also in the uh, um, what I'm planning to do is uh, looking at the whole sample and just seeing, uh, looking at whether healthcare workers view things or experience things differently than people who are not in healthcare. And finally, COVID-19 measures uh, that using the study need further validation. And I'm uh, lucky now uh, being part of a cross-sectional, cross, I'm sorry, cross-national study effort to pool uh, uh, cases that we have or data that we already have collected from different countries uh, using the same measures that I just discussed and uh, doing uh, psychometric analyses uh, on, on, on these measures using different populations from different countries. So um, my conclusion is that uh, first of all, you know, despite these limitation, there is some contribution to understanding cross-cultural experiences uh, of the pandemic um, based on this study. Uh, uh, I have added evidence with my data for the role of political ideology and belief in science in shaping COVID-19 views and behaviors 
And finally, I, um, I've added this new angle of looking at healthcare workers across countries and how they report on uh, national and workplace responses um, to the pandemic. Um, and I think that the, the, the difference between Poland and the US in terms of the healthcare workers' experiences and views uh, reflect the differential burden of the pandemic during the time of the study and uh, different healthcare systems as well, and possibly cultural differences in outlook on treatments and vaccine developments between healthcare workers in different countries. And so uh, as the last thing, I want to show you where we are today in terms of the comparison of COVID cases between the US and Poland. As you see, the cases have surged between my, the time of my study and uh, uh, you know, through November and the winter months in Poland, but there's still a gap with the US leading in cases. The same thing with deaths, um, much higher rates uh, from fall through winter uh, in Poland than before, but still not as high as in the US. And finally, on a hopeful note, vaccinations where we are with vaccinations in the US and Poland. And in this case, the US is leading, uh, I think globally now, and, but Poland is also is, uh, is on this effort to vaccinate everyone. So thank you so much for everybody, uh, to everybody for being here, for listening in, and especially I want to thank the participants in the study and everybody who helped to facilitate my survey. It was very important. So I appreciate everyone. And we'll take some questions I get, I guess, from the chat, David, thank you. Yes, thank you, and a virtual applause. Um, there are a few questions already in the chat. I'll encourage the audience, if you have questions, to go ahead and type them in. We don't have a lot of time, but let me jump right in and, and read the two questions from Alejandra Colon Lopez. So her first question was, did you collect religious attendance? Would you expect different results with this other measure? What about a binary variable distinguishing mainstream religious denominations from other religions and non-believers? That's a great question. And uh, the only question that I had not on the survey, on the survey was uh, uh, the degree of religiosity that people had. So I did not ask about the denominations and, um, uh, and other measures of religiosity were also not used in the study. So it's uh, obviously in the future, it's a great opportunity to look at different denominations. In fact, there are already some uh, studies from Poland that are coming out looking at the Polish Catholic Church and the response uh, uh, to the pandemic within uh, that particular religion. And I think it's, uh, in the US, we also see it with some um, uh, studies looking at different Christian and um, uh, other religions as well um, uh, to see how the, the responses to the pandemic were different. But in this study, I was limited uh, just to uh, look at the religiosity. Great, thanks. Yeah, Hendra has a, a second question. For healthcare workers, do you have information of their role, like physician, nurse, advanced practice provider? What about well being scores for estimating burnout? Uh, so, another great question. And I do have information about where they uh, are. Uh, so, mostly um, physicians and nurses in the Polish subsample, but then uh, very few nurses and other type of medical workers in the US subsample, so not exactly equivalent. Um, and I will be looking at um, the uh, um, psychological distress among workers, healthcare workers is um, similar or different from people who are not health in healthcare, but I have not done that yet. But that, that's the only, I, I will also be able to look at the financial impacts in this subsample as well. Great, thanks. So the next question is from Carolina Mukhtar who asks, do you have any data on vaccine and vaccine brand hesitancy? My friends and relatives in Poland seem to strongly prefer the Pfizer vaccine and they consider Moderna an inferior product. I wonder why that is. <laughs> uh, that's an ongoing discussion in the US as well as people feel more comfortable with the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines than with Johnson & Johnson, let's say. Um, it, it's, uh, I don't have any data on vaccines, uh, but I think there's emerging, um, there's other literature that is looking at those things in the US. And I haven't looked to see if there's already some literature in Poland. There wasn't any, obviously, when, at the time when I was doing the study six months ago, but there could be some new information from Poland as well. Uh, and it's definitely a, a target for us in the US. And I imagine in many countries, 
to make sure that people are on board with getting vaccinated. So there, there is a campaign, the educational campaigns are underway and, you know, asking um, like in, yes, last night's uh, President Biden's uh, speech, you know, asking uh, people to ask others to get vaccinated, right? So there's a whole campaign and uh, that level as well. So it would be very interesting to look at the cross-national, cross-cultural um, comparison of uh, attitudes toward vaccination and then getting vaccinated as well. I agree. There's two more questions I think we can squeeze in here before we run out of time. So the next one from Catherine Danilo is Poland using the Russian Sputnik vaccine? I'm wondering in light of history and the very turmoiled relationship between Russia and Poland. Um, it's, I'm not sure 100%. Uh, I know that some Poles actually want to travel to Russia to get Sputnik, uh, but I don't know if it's nationally available. I, and I like the, the Polish uh, uh, person who just asked about uh, prefer preference for Pfizer vaccines, there's definitely I, I hear that a lot in Poland, the preference for Western vaccines. But I have also talked to people who are ready uh, in Poland, who are ready to fly to Moscow or to China and get the vaccines from those two countries uh, just because they can't wait. Or they, they say, OK, if I don't get it in Poland by May or June, then I'll make the trip somewhere to get it. So there are different approaches. Thank you for this question. Interesting. And so the next question we have is from Michael Ann Markowitz, who asks, since U.S. is a constitutional republic, perhaps a comparison with states in Poland would be better. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, the fact that Poland is a much smaller country and it's everything is, you know, national, national government. Um, uh, the provinces have some autonomy, but not as much as the U.S. states. Uh, I have done in the past studies comparing health outcomes in the United States and Poland, where I uh, used aerial, uni aerial units like counties and states in the U.S. and then provinces in Poland to see when I was looking at the influence of um, uh, ecological factors on health of individuals. And um, there were some you know, you could look at um, health infrastructures in different parts of Poland and obviously in the US and counties at the local level and states, and that would bear some uh, difference. Uh, here, I think because in Poland, there was this national effort to close everything, to um, introduce national mask mandate and basically everything is top down, right? In the US, uh, the authority, states have autonomy and so there's the diversity of responses to the pandemic through the US so that is different so you can think you know you're comparing apples and oranges maybe but then if you just look at the national level responses maybe there's more area for um, comparison great I've got one last question that came in and then we will close the last question from Shahid Mukhtar do you think ethnic diversity plays a role in your data analysis, given the two countries don't have similar levels of diversity? Uh, so um, I was lucky in a sense that the sample was more uh, homogenous on both sides, the US and Poland. So uh, mostly white, um, non-Hispanic, and then Polish uh, people who are uh, mostly white as well. So I didn't have any blacks in Poland. Um, and uh, in the US, I had the percentage uh, population that were um, of the sample of respondents that were um, black or Hispanics were about three to four percent. So not really well represented of the U.S. Um, population. Um, and so um, I could not actually look into the racial ethnic differences uh, in the experiences and responses um, uh, reactions to the pandemic. Uh, but I definitely, in the paper that I have published from these data, I discuss it as an important uh, uh, future direction, because even in Poland, we have different ethnicities, especially people, uh, immigrants from, uh, other, from the former Soviet Union that are in Poland and from other, you know, even from the Western countries, a lot of Westerners now live in Poland as well, or reside in Poland for business and also to live. So it would be interesting to look at the ethnicities, but the data for that are not available currently. And certainly I did not have the data in my study for it. 
Terrific. Well, uh, I think this is a good time to close given we've passed the hour. Uh, let's give one more round of applause to Dr. Slavarsky and thanks for a, for a terrific thought provoking talk. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the invitation and thank you everyone for listening. Thanks. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.